It's good to be in God's house. Let me share, just share a couple of quick thoughts that come to us from the Word of God. First one from Second Chronicles, excuse me, Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound in you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. There's a lot of alls in there, right? All grace, all sufficiency, all things, all times, centered in God. First Peter also tells us this, the God of all grace will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Aren't those exciting things? God wants to confirm things. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to establish you in him. That's the God that we worship. Let's stand together as we open up our time of song with the King of Grace. That's me. It gave me like another like mini solo. I don't often get that. It's awesome. <laughs> Pastor's going to talk about online giving. Let me give you my account afterward. Right. So those. Let's just continue in worship. God is good. All the time, and all the time. There's a peace I've come to know. Overcome and the 
God's word in the book of Ephesians. It says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power, talking about strength again, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, love coming up again, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints 
what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth? How many here like want to just know the answers to so much stuff? Right? We all do, right? And so much of God's word is clear. So much of it is not so clear. But we want to know it all. The scripture here says God's going to infuse you. If we're grounded and rooted in him, he's going to give you strength to comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, the depth. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The goal is being filled with God, isn't it? It's not knowledge. It's being full of God. And if we do that, we'd get a glimpse and a sense on how deep, how wide, the breadth, the width of God's goodness. Let's sing together how deep the Father's love for us. Should I gain from his dream? 
Jesus took to the cross have paid the ransom that was due for our freedom. So, Lord God, we, we thank you for that. We praise your name, and we ask your presence to weigh heavily upon us as we share together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Welcome, church. Good to see everybody. Oops. Um. We're going to spend some time praying now. Would, would that be okay with you guys if we pray some this morning? So we're going to spend time in silent prayer. There's a lot going on, uh, no doubt, uh, in people's individual circumstances in your home and in, in your own heart. And we would invite you to bring those things before the Lord this morning. Uh, we're going to be coming to the Lord's table in a little while. So if you didn't get your communion elements, you're going to want to run out and grab those in the, uh, in the lobby. But have that in mind as we pray this morning. That, that there's something that we need to turn from and turn to, uh, take that opportunity while we're praying together at the beginning of our service. And then I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer for the influence of the church in our community. You know, we're not, we're not just here so we can enjoy spending time in worship and, and spending time together, but we're here to be strengthened and be, to be equipped so that we can be an army of God, that when we leave here, uh, we can be influential uh, for God's kingdom in our community. I'm going to lead us in a time specifically to pray that way, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Okay? Let's pray together. Lord, our God, we count it a great privilege to come before you in prayer, not just corporately on a Sunday morning, but with a, an awareness that every time we lift up our, our voices and our minds and our hearts towards you, Lord, that you're attentive to the, the burdens that we carry uh, on behalf of others and uh, for our own circumstances, Lord. So I pray that you uh, would make us aware in our own spirits that you have heard our prayer, that you've been attentive, and that you're working in the circumstances of each one of us. And Lord, we're, we're grateful to be part of the church, the church universal, the body of Christ here in our community. Lord, we're, we just want to praise your name that we've been back for 12 Sundays now, Lord, and for the privilege that we have to worship together. And Lord, I, I pray that as we spend this time together as followers of Jesus Christ, that, that we embrace the opportunity that we have to be strengthened and to be equipped and to encourage one another in uh, taking territory for your kingdom in our community, Lord. And it's not, it's not a, a violent act of, of uh, besieging a community, but it's, it's, it's an act of almost violent love because it's, it's uh, so influential and so strong, Lord, that as we take the love of God from this place, that you would use us, Lord, is, is uh, unthinkable. But we know it's your desire and it's your plan for the church. So, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't shrink back from the opportunity in, that we have to be able to share the good news of Jesus and to share the love of God in this place at this time among the people that you've called us to minister to. We shared at the 8 o'clock service this morning how we, we are in, uh, so uh, diverse in, in uh, geography. We've got people that drive for 35, 45 minutes to get here on a Sunday morning, Lord, and that's an awesome blessing. But, Lord, I pray that you would enlarge our territory, not from a geographic perspective, but from a spiritual perspective, and that we would take back from the enemy what rightfully belongs to you. We pray this in all things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
And forgive us our debts as we, we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you for praying along with me, church. And uh, if you got your Bible with me, you, let me see your Bible. Who's got your Bible with you this morning? Hold up your Bibles. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13 this morning. Luke chapter 4, the first 13 verses. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when he had, they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. May God grant us this day an understanding of this, this holy word. Well, if you were here last week or you watched online, you know we started a new sermon series last Sunday. Uh, based kind of loosely on a book in a ministry called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Pete Scazzaro. It looks just like this. Uh, and we're going to kind of follow that probably a little bit more closely this week than most. Um, but uh, it's not going to be strictly, a, I'm not going to be strictly teaching out of this book, but we're going to be applying, applying the principles of uh, Pete's teaching uh, to our lives and to uh, hopefully to our circumstances. So well, uh, what we're looking at today is the concept of knowing ourselves. Have you ever thought about that, like knowing yourself? I mean, I've known myself my whole life, right? Uh, I was there when I was born, so I ought to know, right? I, we ought, by now, we ought to know ourselves. But if you were here last Sunday, or again, you watched online, remember the iceberg picture that we looked at? Uh, and so we spent a lot of time on the, the tip of that iceberg that's above the surface of the water, sprucing that up, because that's where we're kind of comfortable. Sometimes to get below the surface... Uh, into the things that we deal with personally are not, is not so comfortable. Amen? So that's what we're going to be looking at. How can we possibly know ourselves, our true identity? And so when we're looking at uh, a false identity and, and living a, a different kind of life, the first thing that we want to look at is our big idea for today. And this is right out of the book. The big idea is that living and swimming in the river of God's love. How do you like that for imagery? for us in, in Christ is at the very heart of true spirituality. Soaking in this love enables us to surrender to God's will, especially when it seems so contrary to what we see, feel, or figure out ourselves. So that's what we're going to want to have in the back of our minds as we get into the message for today. Um, anybody ever heard of a guy named St. Augustine or St. Augustine? Same guy, it's just pronounced differently, right? So uh, he's the main theologian uh, that has uh, a lot of people, particularly the Catholic Church, base their doctrine on. So I'm going to find some opportunity to dis disagree with him if we get down into like real nitty-gritty. But he's uh, quoted, actually he wrote in a book uh, around 200, uh, sorry, 397 A.D., maybe 400, somewhere in that range. He said, how can you grow close to God when you're so far from yourself. When you're far from yourself, how can you go close, close to God? Because we want him to know us, and we ask him to search us and those kinds of things. He calls us in similar ways to search and know ourselves. And so I was thinking about the imagery uh, for uh, the, the concept of having a false self and, and putting on airs and, you know, acting like we're one thing when we're not quite another. 
And I thought about all the way back to the beginning of the book. We just uh, finished a series in the book of Genesis, which is one end of the book. But way back at the other, be- other end of the book, the beginning of, of the book, is the book of Genesis. And you remember what happened to Adam and Eve? You know what happened to Adam and Eve? They sinned, didn't they? Thanks a lot, Adam and Eve, right? Uh, the Bible says as through uh, one man, Adam, the first Adam, sin entered into the world. I want to share with you an image that I have about this idea of living in a false self, and that is fig leaves. So uh, that's a picture of fig leaves. But it says back in Genesis, after Adam and Eve sinned, uh, you know, they've been walking around naked with nothing to be ashamed of. But then it says, then their eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So all of a sudden, they, they walked around. They had nothing to be ashamed of. They were living uh, in their true identity in the very presence of God, walking around the garden, and because sin entered into the world, what happened was suddenly they were ashamed of who they truly were. And so that's what we want to look at as we get into the text this morning, Uh, and we're going to look at the temptation of Jesus. That's what our text is often called. Uh, and just by, so you, so you know where we are in Scripture, right? That you remember that this happens when Jesus is led into the wilderness for 40 days um, to be tempted. He's led there by God the Holy Spirit. Now, he received the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Remember, he was baptized by John the Baptist. It says he went down to the water and he came up out of the water. And uh, then the, the Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. So that has just happened and then right after that, according to Scripture, he was led out into the wilderness where he spends 40 days. So we're going to spend most of our time here. We'll turn pages a little bit. We'll spend most of our time here in Luke chapter 4. And uh, what we're going to see, I hope, is that how these three temptations that Satan brings before Jesus still tempt us today, right? And they all have to do with his identity, And so we can receive those same temptations of the enemy. If we're not careful, we start to assume what we're going to call today a false identity. All right? So the first thing that that we're going to, uh, I want to take a look at is out of the book. And remember last week we talked about symptoms? We talked about symptoms last week, and, and symptoms are a ma- an outward manifestation of something that's going on inside, right? So if you go to a, a doctor, uh, even if you have to do it online, they'll say, well, what are your symptoms? In my old world, we call it signs and symptoms, S&S. Literally, it was abbreviated that way. And you'd accumulate, uh, here's all the, si- the outward signs of something, uh, and so that helps us determine what's going on inside, right? And that's how we looked at symptoms last Sunday. Uh, but we're going to list 15 symptoms, and don't try to write these down. I know some of you are going to be really tempted. I can, if I write really fast, I can keep up. You're not going to be able to keep up. So I'm um, going uh, get a copy of the book, because they're all in Chapter 2, I think it is. But uh, So we're going to list 15 signs and symptoms, if you will, of uh, living a false self. Okay, we're all together on that. These are the signs and symptoms, the outward manifestation of us living a false self. Okay, so the first one he says is, I say yes when I really mean no. Amen? All right, so uh, that's, that's the first one of living a false self. And he says, I get depressed when people are upset with me. Ever, anybody? Right? So um, I have a need to be approved by others to feel good about myself. Anybody resonate with that one a little bit? I need the approval of other people so I can feel good about myself. I act nice on the outside, but inside I can't stand you. Amen? A lot of people at 8 o'clock, I'm just telling you, a lot of people at 8 o'clock said yes. So just be careful of the people from 8 o'clock. I often remain silent in order to keep the peace, right? Um, I believe that if I make mistakes, I myself am a failure. I avoid looking weak or foolish for not having the answer. How about personal evangelism? What's the number one uh, objection that people have to sharing the gospel with other people? What if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? Number one response or objection that people have with sharing their faith with other people. Okay, um... 
I criticize others in order to feel better about myself. Did you see the shirt he was wearing? Some of you are going to be saying that on the way home. Don't do it. I heard an amen from this side of the room. Did you? Anybody else? If you know who that was, tell me on the way out, all right? Uh, I need to be doing something exceptional to feel alive. Like just the, like the routine. I need to be doing something that's like really a big deal, right? Uh, I, need to, I need to be needed to feel alive, to feel alive. I'm fearful and can't take risks. I do what others want so they don't get mad at me. Yeah, exactly. I use knowledge and competence to cover my feelings of inadequacy. Amen? Right? Um, I want my, this is a good one. I, I want my children to behave well so others will think I'm a good parent. Huh? Amen? Yeah, I know exactly, right? I think that's what social media was invented for, so we can impress other people with how good our kids are, right? <laughs> I compare. I don't know what's going on here this morning, but I'm not entirely comfortable with it. But okay. Uh, I compare myself a lot to other people. So if you find yourself comparing yourself to other people, then that might be a symptom of living a false self. The first symptom that we're going to take a look at here in, in uh, the Scripture this morning, uh, there's going to be three things. I'm, I'm calling them our fig leaves, right? The things with which we are trying to cover our shame about who we truly are. Okay, you with me? Uh, so our, what our fig leaves are, the first one, they all start with P. Uh, the first one's performance. So you could subtitle that, I am what I do. All right? So my identity comes from the things that I do. You ever, you ever feel that way? And I, I think I probably confessed this last Sunday. It's a little bit difficult for me sometimes as a pastor because as soon as people find out, like, oh, he's a pastor. Right? And I don't know what that means exactly, right? But, but we have certain assumptions, right, that, that come around that based on our experience, you know, pastors that you've been around and that kind of thing. And so you, you, there's certain labels that you're going to apply to it. But so, and sometimes that's a good thing, right? And sometimes I, I'm like, yeah, I'm a pastor. Straighten up, right? But uh, other times it's like I don't want to tell anybody because of those assumptions that they make. But what we do for God is not who we are. Amen? So it doesn't matter if you're on the worship team or the tech team or the welcome team or you teach a class or, or whatever it is you do or you work in youth ministry, any of those kinds of things. That's good. And we ought to use our gifts and graces to God's glory. Amen? But that is not where our identity comes from. If we find ourselves allowing that to become our identity, then maybe we're wearing a fig leaf to cover who we truly are. Because we know that it's not a, we can't do anything to earn our way into heaven, right? Don't we? We know that, church, don't we? You can't, you can't impress God. You can't earn your way into heaven So by doing good things. So why are we still trying to earn our way into heaven by doing good things? Because let's be honest, a lot of us are. We have a hard time drawing that line between, between uh, work salvation and, and trying to impress God with all the things that we do. Like we're going to stand in judgment and, he's gonna, and we're going to say, Lord God, you're not going to believe it, but I did all the, I, for 20 years I was on the, on the I was greeter. And he's going to be like, wow, really? Enter into my rest. I mean, that's not the way that works, right? It's through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that, that we were, it's, not by, it's by grace we are saved through faith and not of works. Because if we could do it on our own, then we would boast about it. We'd have something to be proud about, wouldn't we? We'd be performance-based. Our fig leaf would be based on our performance. But in Romans chapter 3, in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, uh, Paul writes to the church in Rome. He reminds them, by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, in God's sight. And through the law comes no knowledge of sin. It's, we, the law's purpose is so that we become aware of our inability to earn our salvation. But in the flesh, we're still trying to, we're still trying to perform for God. Now, I mentioned the, the, the text, the context of, of today's 
passage. And it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was, ar was around by the spirit of the wilderness, was led around, excuse me, for 40 days being tempted by the devil. So the devil is tempting him. He's led there by God the Holy Spirit. So God the Holy Spirit intentionally leads him into the devil's presence. How about that, right? Um, and it says that uh, he ate nothing during those days. And when they, when they had ended, when the 40 days had ended, he became hungry. Now notice it didn't say that after uh, like the first four hours out in the desert, he became really hungry. No, he lasted 40 days before he even got really hungry. I always thought that was kind of impressive. But the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. If you're really who you say you are, you can make a miracle happen right here, right now. But right before this, like we said, it is when he was baptized. So John the Baptist baptizes Jesus underwater in the Jordan River. He's raised again. The Holy Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove. Now, from a, from a worldly perspective, he hadn't done anything all that impressive yet. Up to that point, he'd been living a, a normal kind of a life. You know, this is the beginning of his ministry. And so he, he, was, he was a carpenter, right? He, he lived amongst the people. He was a, he said, the Bible says that he looks pretty much like everybody else. He wasn't taller or better looking. He was living a life in the flesh as a regular person. But in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, in Matthew 3, 17, it says, And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And he hadn't done anything yet in the flesh. He hadn't turned water into wine yet. He hadn't cleansed the leper. He hadn't raised anybody from the dead. He hadn't performed. He hadn't done all these things that we associate with Jesus. He hadn't, he hadn't been the miraculous Savior yet. He was all, but all he did was have an identity with his Father. And he said, even though he hasn't done anything, I love him and he pleases me. But what the enemy tries to tell him is that if you don't do this, if you don't perform a miracle, if you don't do something really dramatic, then that means you're incapable. And that's a lie of the devil. And that's one of the temptations, or the first of the three temptations. And he's, the devil is a liar from the beginning. And he's telling Jesus here, hey, if you can't do this, then you're nothing. And that's what we look at. We have that same temptation. We embrace that same temptation in our lives. Because we think, if I can't do stuff really well, that means I'm incapable, I'm no good, I'm worthless to God, and that is a lie. Jesus responds really specifically, doesn't he? He said, it is written. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8. He's quoting Scripture back to the devil. That's how Jesus responds in the face of that temptation. So the second temptation that's offered to, to Jesus here is uh, the second P in our outline is possessions. Possessions. And you can subtitle that one as I am what I have. And in verse 5, he said, they led him up into the, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, we don't know exactly how it's possible to see all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment, but supernaturally, Jesus sees everything. This is like the entire world, right, all at once. And the devil said to him, I will give all of this to you because it's my domain. And I have authority. I can do that. And, and he says, all you got to do is bow down and worship me, and I'll give you everything. I'll give it to you. You'll have everything in the world. Stuff is an enormous temptation, isn't it? 
I read a statistic. I, I got to give you a little bit of statistics, right? So I read a statistic the other day that the average person in America sees around 10,000 advertisements a day. A day. And every one of those advertisements is telling you and telling your children that if you would just have this thing, then you'd be happy. You'd be everything that God's got for you if you just had more. And that that's a reflection on how much God really loves you if you have more. And that's a lie. Right? It, it, it's a lie because the Bible tells us really clearly that it's not about what we have. And, and, you know, in Mark chapter 8, verses 36, it says, For what does a profit a man to gain the whole world? The whole world had just been promised to Jesus. But what does a profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? So I'm turn now to Mark in chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verses 21 and 22. You remember, this is where Jesus comes and he, he meets this guy that we refer to as the rich young ruler. He meets a wealthy young man who was really religious. And the guy says, what do I have to do to get to heaven? And Jesus tells him, well, you've got to follow the law perfectly. And he tries to act like he's done it. And he says, I've kept your law perfectly since the time I was a youth. And Jesus says, there's still one thing that you lack. Go give up all your stuff and then come follow me. It's a two-stage two process, right? And so in verse 21, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. Jesus loved this guy. He wasn't, he wasn't condemning him. He wasn't try, cr being critical of him. He loved him, and he loved him so much to tell him the truth. And what he tells him is, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But at these words, he was saddened, and he went away grieving. He was one, for he was one who had, who owned much property. He had a lot of stuff. He went away grieving. Like somebody died, right? Not like, oh, man, really? I got to give up all my stuff. He went away with grief in his heart because he couldn't do it. We don't know what ever happened to this guy, honestly. But he went away grieving because he didn't want to surrender his stuff. Um, I've, I've shared my testimony with a lot of people over the years, but a big part of my testimony isn't money, but it is stuff associated with that because um, I got to a point where I thought I was doing pretty well professionally and I thought I was a pretty big deal. And I was going to become a vice president in a pharmaceutical company. I didn't know which one yet because I, I wasn't going to wait around for more than a year or two. Uh, I had a big office on the top of the GSB building on City Line Avenue in Belmont. Looking out over City Line Avenue, I had a, my own parking space with my name on it where I parked my motorcycle. But that's what I was about. Because it was pretty impressive, I thought. I was impressing myself. And just like when Jesus hears this from the devil and he says, you know, you just, all you got to do is worship me. You can have everything. I, was, I wanted everything. And just like when the devil told Jesus that, it was a lie. And praise the Lord, I came to faith in Christ, and, and he started to change my own heart in that a whole lot. But man, I'll tell you, I was after stuff. I mean, look at the org chart. How many people report up in the organization to me? What's the, what title does it say on the door? You know, what, what does it say on my business card? And I was flying around uh, the country doing interviews, for, you know, to they'd fly me to San Diego for an interview to be vice president someplace. I mean, that's a pretty big deal, right? Man, they're flying me across the country for an interview. And I thought that was going to give me value. That became my identity. And it was a lie of the devil. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with 
all things to enjoy. Don't become conceited in what you've got. Now, there's nothing wrong with having nice stuff, right? And so, like Dave Ramsey says all the time, I'm not mad at you if you drive a nice car or live in a nice house. But it's all about the attitude that we have towards those things. Is that where we get our identity, or is it a blessing of God that we can use in his kingdom work to his glory? Paul had a very different attitude. But you know what? It's a, the, the lie, really, is that if I don't have those things, and I don't have the same kind of things or even better things than somebody else has, that makes me a failure. And that's a lie. All right? Uh, Paul had a very different attitude. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. What's really important in my life? Or am I going to walk away grieving because I'm afraid to give up this stuff that I've accumulated? Because that's how I ident identify myself to the world is at the tip of my iceberg. And so the next, the G Jesus responds the same way, doesn't he? He says, Jesus answered him in verse 8, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6. It is written. Right, so every time, I, anybody know who Evie Hill was, right? He was a, a really great pastor, man. I, if I had half to juice him, you guys would be blown away right now. He was a great preacher. I, I just love Evie Hill. But he talked about this, a, a promise keepers uh, thing back in the late 80s in Detroit, where he talked about how this, this same passage, how every time the enemy tried to tempt Jesus, what he did was he hit him in the mouth with Scripture. Over and over again, he brings Scripture. And, you know, Paul describes that as the one offensive weapon that we're given in the full armor of God. Remember? The Word is our sword. So that's how we're going to do combat with the enemy. Every time he tries to tell us a lie, every time he tries to tell us, if you don't have enough stuff, if you don't have enough, uh, if you don't do enough for God, then, then you're not any good. You're a complete, abysmal, incapable failure. That is wrong. We need to come back to Scripture every single time. And Paul is really clear in that passage in Philippians 3 that none of it means anything. It's rubbish. It's garbage compared to who we truly are in Christ. So the third and final P in our outline is popularity. Popularity is, is a big deal, right? Who here has more than 500 Facebook friends? Anybody? Right? So you don't want to raise your hand, right? But that's, that's how we measure our popularity, right? Like, you know, how many followers do I have on Instagram? How many friends do I have on Facebook? How many likes do my posts get? Those kinds of things. How popular am I? And that's what happened. Jesus is, gets the same kind of thing. He's in verse 9. And he led him, this is so, Satan leads him to Jerusalem and so, tells him to stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. And then Look what happens next. Satan quotes Scripture, Psalm 91. He will command his angels concerning you and guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, and you won't even strike your foot against a stone. The quoting Scripture is also a tool of the enemy. That, you know, Jesus has brought it against him, and he turns it around and tries to use that same weapon against him. And Jesus is unimpressed. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy chapter 6. But popularity is a big deal, isn't it? Nobody wants to be unpopular, right? But we, we want to be popular. We want to be well-liked. We want to be well-thought of, don't we? Um, I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. So this is just a, like a page or two over in your Bible towards the back. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 24, But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. This is, this is Jesus preaching, and this is what we call the Beatitudes, kind of, uh, most of the time. 
but um, you are receiving your comfort in full. Everything you, you're getting, you're getting now, is kind of what he's saying. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets the same way. Woe to you when men treat, speak well of you. Seems kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? Seems to be Jesus' way. Because what happens is when we start to stand for things that Jesus stands for, sometimes they're not so popular. So it, this is an election year. Did you guys know it's an election year? Anybody notice it's an election year? You notice that, right? So you know how most politicians form their platforms, and that's what they're going to stand on, right? Is they do surveys, don't they? They take polls. Remember when you had to do polls on a phone? Thank God for caller ID, amen? Right? But remember when you used to get uh, pollsters on the phone, and they would, they would ask you a bunch of questions. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about this? And they'd accumulate all the information, and then they'd, that a lot of politicians will decide that they're going to stand on whatever's popular. You know what I'm talking about? So, so imagine that if there's a survey done in the United States of America that says the majority of people think that it's okay to kill a baby before it's born. Then politicians are going to say, well, okay, if that's what's popular, that's what I'll do. That's not what God says. There are churches, there are entire denominations that are looking at the culture to inform them. What is it we should stand on? What is it we should believe? You tell us. No, that's not what the church is designed to do. The church is designed to inform the culture what it is they should believe. This book is designed to inform each one of us what we should believe. We're not going to do a survey and say, well, do you like this or do you not like this? Is it favorable or is it unfavorable? As soon as it gets to 51%, then we're in. We're going to change our doctrine. No. There's, there's denominations that say, well, you know, that, that was 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and, you know, times have changed a lot, and we're different now. And Jesus says, I am the same yesterday Today and forever, I, let's go King James, I changeth not. Amen? Jesus isn't going to take a poll and see what the culture says is important and what we ought to be basing our belief systems on. No, he says, no, you, 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 I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I'm the only way. It doesn't matter what Oprah says. Amen, right? James chapter 4, verse 4, the brother of Jesus himself writes down in James chapter 4, verse 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now remember, in John 17, he didn't pray that we be removed from the world, right? He, you know, he says, I, I'm going to pray for my followers because they're in the world. Not of it, but in it. You remember that? And so in, in Scripture, we're told that we're supposed to be influential, and that's why we prayed for the church to be influential in the culture, not for the culture to influence the church at the beginning of our service today. John chapter 6, verse 66, and yes, there is a chapter 6, or verse 666. Jesus revealing that he wasn't so popular sometimes too. Because he had just taught on, we're, we're going to come to the Lord's Supper in just a little while, come to the table. And he had just taught them that this is my body and my blood, you know, given for you. And, and his, the, the people that follow, were following Jesus are like all freaked out. They're like, man, well, that's a hard teaching. Really? Yeah, you know, it's, and I can't really quite digest that. And so what happens is a lot of people who had been following Jesus abandoned him. They walked away. Because the truth was hard for them to digest. He didn't do a survey. How many here think that this should be my body given for you, right? No, that's not what he did. 
He just told them the way it was, right? And it's kind of up to them to follow the, the, the truth that he was teaching, and that's the way that God works. But the, the culture and the lie that the enemy tries to give us is that if we are not popular enough, if we're not acceptable, you know, we're afraid to, to, to stand for the things of God. And because, it, well, what happens if, if I, you know, I put this thing on Facebook or something like that and people start unfriending me? So what? Right? And let's be realistic. You know, we went to the March for Life the last two Januaries, and there's a lot of people that are kind of concerned about it. And there's other reasons why they might not make it, but they're kind of concerned about it. What if, you know, I check in at the March for Life, and, and a lot of people say it's, it's, that's an unpopular thing. What if people don't like me because of the result of that? Too bad. But the cool thing about it is we think that when we stand on the things of God that we're risking our popularity, that somehow we'll become socially stigmatized and unacceptable. But they actually, it's the opposite that's true. Because when, when you go to church, you know, this is a family. And, and so we, we're taught to love one another unconditionally. When you go to the March for Life, for example, and, and you show up there and you think this is an unpopular stance to take and I, nobody's going to like me anymore, and you show up and there's half a million people there, you're going to find out something completely different. People think that it's a big crowd to go to a Penn State football game. Wow, there's like 110,000 people there. Go to the March for Life. It's five, six, seven times that many people are standing up for life. It might be culturally an unpopular stance to take, but it's a popular stance in God's kingdom. So when you forsake the world, you might not be friends with the world anymore, but you get to be friends with a whole new thing. And you know what? We, we tell people, when we got saved, Tina and I got saved four days apart. Some of you know that, right? And we discovered what we call a parallel universe. Did you know there's Christian music? And there's Christian movies, and they're getting better. I mean, back then, that was, they were not so good. You know, it was like some kid with a video camera, but still. There's Christian authors. Did you, did you guys know that? I know that now, but I didn't know that then. Because we're not allowing that stuff to be influential enough in, in the culture. And so we discovered it. We made friends. The best friends that I have now in the world are, are Christians, and they're in church. And so there's a few people that don't want to be friends with me anymore because I don't go to their parties. I don't do the things that I used to do. But that's too bad. So I haven't given up something. I've gained an entire life in Christ that I didn't have before. I mean, John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, that I, I came so that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. Not live in social isolation and, and, and shame, no. But if we're not popular, the lie that we're believing is that if we have to give up stuff that the world says, the culture says, the enemy says is popular, that that makes us a loser. And that's a lie. So right out of the book, uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, this is the danger that we fall into, is that we remain trapped in living a pretend life out of an unhealthy concern for what other people think. Living a pretend life. Faking it, right? And, and trying to be something that we're not, and, and trying to be something that's not what God has for us to be and trying to present ourselves in a way that's not according to the way that God has created us, and pretending. You know, there's, a, there's a, an old quote. It, it's not my quote. I don't know where it came from. But by doing all these things and living this false life and, 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 and pursuing the things of the world and, and trying to get more stuff and, and trying to impress people, it's the definition of the rat race. So somebody said one time, we spend most of our lives working in jobs we hate so that we can make more money to buy things that we don't need to impress people we don't like anyway. That's the definition of living, being trapped in a pretend life. But we do it. We go along with it. I 
Now, I just want to look, if you've if you got your pen, get your Bible open. In verse 3, it says, this is what the devil says to Jesus. I want you to underline, circle, put a box around it, whatever you want to do. He says, if you are the Son of God, if you really are the Son of God, then you can do this. In verse 9, mark it again in your Bible. If you are the Son of God, twice in the three temptations that the devil brings to Jesus, he says, if you really are the Son of God, then you've got to prove it. You've got to show it off somehow. And if you don't do that, then you are an abysmal, you're incapable, you're a complete failure, and I'm going to label you a loser. And we buy that same thing. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. I'm going to wrap up with this. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Paul writes to the church, church, we are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We are all sons of God. Did you hear that? We are all adopted children of the Most High God who have repented of our sins and who have turned to Jesus Christ for their forgiveness of our sins so that we can be brought into a right, reconciled relationship with him. We're adopted into his family, so we are sons of God. So when Jesus is, being, is coming up out of the water from his bapt- baptism, as we looked at, and that voice from the heavens comes down and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Church, that's what God says about you when you turn from your sins and turn to God. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. So when the enemy tries to tell you you got to do something, that you got to be something that you are not, then he is lying to you because God himself, God the Father has pronounced you a beloved son and a beloved daughter when you put your trust in his son Jesus Christ. He loves you that much, and he is pleased with you. And that's our job, is to put up away the false self. The Bible tells us that we are born again. The old has passed away, and the new has come. When we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we put off that false self, and we are born again to a new life with Jesus Christ. And he loves us. He is so crazy about you that he is willing to die for you. That's who you are in Christ. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter what floor your office is on. It doesn't matter what the org chart is. It doesn't matter what's printed on your business card. And it doesn't matter how many Facebook friends you've got or what the culture might say. When you stand with God, you're on the right side. And that's the identity that he has created each one of us to walk in. So we come back to our big idea today, and that's that living and swimming in the river of God's love for us in Christ is at the very heart of true spirituality. Soaking in this love enables us to surrender to God's will, especially when it seems so contrary to what we can see, feel, or figure out ourselves. So now what? This is out of the book also, so I'm not going to give you all the detail on it. But I'm talking about dying to your false self, embracing your true identity in Christ. So he's saying pay attention to your interior, the stuff that's below the surface of the iceberg, right, Uh, in silence and solitude. We need to learn how to be quiet and still before the Lord. And it's a spiritual discipline to be able to do that. We're going to talk more about that the week after next, two weeks from today. You need to find trusted companions, and that means people that are reliable with whom you can be real and reveal your true identity. You don't have to wear a fig leaf around them. And move out of your comfort zone. And and like Schizero quotes, and you've heard similar quotes of this, he said, the pain of living a life 
that was not God's for me finally was greater than the pain of change. Stop faking it and pray for courage. Because it sounds easy on the surface, but unless you do number four, you won't be able to do numbers one through three. Because other people are going to notice the changes that you made. And they're going to be critical. They're going to tell you lies. You're going to hear that voice in the back of your mind, man, if you don't do this and you can't, you're not capable enough, if you're, you're just a failure, you're a loser, don't believe it. So pray for courage to change. And not just to make a change one time, but to persevere and to continue in the changes that God has brought to your life. So let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the privilege that we've had to be in your word today and for all that you do for us. Lord, we are richly and abundantly blessed. We're thankful for the truth of your word and the example that that Jesus has set for us. Lord, I pray that we'd embrace uh, that same truth and, and the courage to live a new kind of life the true life for which you've created each one of us, and that we would embrace the identity that we have through faith. May our true identity shine to the culture around us, and may we become more and more influential and take kingdom territory back to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to come to the table now, so uh, hopefully everybody has your little elements, a little cup looks looks like this. If you don't have them, they are available out in the lobby. Feel free to run out and grab one. Um, And just so you're aware, we have what's called an open communion here at the Lighthouse, which means you don't have to be a member here. Uh, If you want to learn more about being a member, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but October 3rd is a membership retreat. But um, if you're trusting in Christ alone for your salvation, then you're welcome to participate uh, at the Lord's table with us. So uh, you're going to want to go ahead and start taking that clear plastic uh, film off the top of the cup and get that wafer out. We'll hold that in our hands. I'll say the words of institution and we'll share that together. And the scripture explains to us that on the night on which he was betrayed, Jesus took a piece of bread as he was dining with his disciples, and he broke it apart, and he, he blessed it, and he, he gave thanks for it, and he passed it to them, and he said, this is my body. He said, take it and eat it. And I've given this for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this remembering me. You want to carefully peel off that second layer of film and expose the cup. And after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he told them, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood. And as often as you would drink of it, do so remembering me. Lord, our God, as we've come to your table, we're we're blessed to receive that invitation. And if there is one here this morning who has not yet claimed their identity in Christ, Lord, I pray that you would stir their hearts to repentance and to faith and to trusting in Jesus. May we walk as true adopted sons and daughters of the Most High God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen going to make a few announcements as we, uh, the worship team comes back up. i uh, remind you to check in on Facebook. If you haven't already checked in on Facebook, use the hashtag this month, School for Kids. So every time you check in and use that hashtag, School for Kids, you're helping provide uh, education for needy children in Haiti. So that's a pretty awesome thing you can do that simply. Uh, and we want to welcome our first-time guests, of course. And if you're not connected here at the church, like you're not getting an email from me, on a weekly basis and that kind of thing. 
Um, it probably because we don't have your, your contact information. So if you go online to trinitylighthouse.org, um, there's, you can click on a thing that says connection card, fill out an online connection card. Uh, you can put prayer requests in there. Um, and as much as information as you would like to give us, we'd love to keep you up to date on some of the things going on here at the church. So that's awesome. Uh, the women, uh, fall women's precept study starts this coming Wednesday, Saturday, uh, September 9th at 10 a.m. in the library, uh, starting on the book of Malachi. Um, on September the 14th, a uh, week from tomorrow, is that right? Um, there's a woman's dessert and devotion, and um, all you got to do is, if you're a lady of any age, you're welcome to join that. Uh, bring your own chair, a dessert, and a beverage with you, and ha- you're going to hang out in the parking lot, maintaining some social distancing there. Uh, as you're probably aware, it's been in our announcements for a while, there's an Operation Christmas Child shoebox packing party coming up on uh, Saturday, November 14th. And if you've not been part of one of those, uh, it's a lot of fun. So I would encourage you to be part of it. We meet down in the social hall. You pick up all the stuff that we're collecting now. And during the month of September, we're collecting clothing items. You know, it's not like parkas and stuff like that because it has to go in a shoebox. So a T-shirt that can roll up, gloves, socks, hats, those kind of things. Uh, You're going to put those over in the collection area in the uh, education wing lobby. And uh, all that stuff that we've collected will be transported down to the social hall, and there'll be a whole system set up. So we can you go around with a shoebox, fill it, label them, and all, all those kind of things. And we, we, there's no reason why we can't donate a couple of hundred shoeboxes uh, out of our church our size. So I would encourage you, everybody to make sure that's on your calendar. And Awana is starting again uh, next month. Amen? Amen, right? So uh, that's an awesome thing. If you've got kids Awana age, which is pretty much any age, you can go ahead and get them signed up. Um, And realistically, we're going to need more volunteers than we're probably going to have. So if you're comfortable in serving that way, certainly you can wear a mask and all the precautions that you might normally want to. We're going to need help to make Awana go really well. Um, I believe it's time for us to minister to our kids face-to-face. So uh, you're going to want to contact the church office to volunteer. Registration is on the church website, trinitylighthouse.org forward slash Awana. Um, And as I mentioned, there's a membership information retreat coming up on Saturday, October 3rd. You don't uh, have to become a member by going to the information retreat. That's so that you can find out more about the doctrine, the history, and the vision that we have for our church here and our denomination in the Evangelical Congregational Church. Uh, It's an opportunity to share all that stuff and see whether or not you think this might be uh, the place that you're going to put down roots. So I would encourage you to sign up uh, through the office so we know how many people are going to come, and uh, also so we know how much Chick-fil-A to order, amen? Because uh, you get Chick-fil-A for lunch but just for showing up. That's your carrot on a stick. Not my theology lecture, although that's a close second. Close. Close, but not quite. But Chick-fil-A, you get uh, to be part of that. And just remember, you can make your donations out in the lobby, uh, drop it in the box, that's cool. Um, or you can go online, sign up for uh, online uh, giving at the church website. And did you know that it's the incidence of fraud, if you're one of those people that's kind of concerned about that, the incidence of fraud through online giving uh, is a whole lot lower than it is by handing out a check? I mean, did you ever think about it? When you hand somebody a check, you give them your bank number, your address, sometimes your phone number, and your signature. Pretty much everything you need to rip off somebody's identity is on a check. Uh, so there's a lot more security on online giving. I encourage you to be part of that. If you're not comfortable with that, I get it, but uh, you can go to your church's bill pay site. Uh, I'm sorry, your bank's bill pay site, uh, and you can sign up to pay your bills online. If A lot of us do that. It probably, if you're not doing that, you ought to do it because it makes it a whole lot easier. Then your bank will cut a check to the church on your behalf as, at your designated frequency and mail it, and you save a stamp every time. Praise the Lord, right? So uh, that's another way you can automate your giving so you don't even have to worry about it. I haven't brought in a check to the church in something like nine, ten years, something like that, because it's all been online, and it makes it a whole lot easier. I want to encourage you to do that. So anyway, we look forward to seeing you next week, next Sunday, uh, two services, 8 and 1030, and don't forget to bring your Bible. We'll see you next week. Amen. This morning we've heard a lot about God's plan, God's love. We've heard about uh, Jesus' death and resurrection. We've heard or should be reminded of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the powerful thing is a lot of the verses we've heard today is use the word all. 
God's love, Jesus' uh, death and resurrection, the Holy Spirit's infilling is for us all. Or as Margie used to say growing up, all y'all, right? It's available to all. Stand together as we sing one more song with the word all in it. It says, Jesus paid it all. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>